Well, the Bible reading today, ladies and gentlemen, is taken from the book of Colossians. You'll find it in your service sheets on the screen or you can follow in your Bibles at home. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 24, going through to chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I'm completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction for his body, that is the church. I've become its minister according to God's administration that was given to me for you to make God's message fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to those among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labour for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged, joined together in love, so that they may have all the riches of a short understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. For I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the strength of your faith in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, in the book of Colossians uh, today, looking at that passage. Uh, you'll notice there at the end uh, of the service section, the outline uh, in your service sheets, there are some coffee questions. Uh, that's just an attempt by me uh, to encourage some discussion after you've spent time together in church thinking about what you've learned and how you might share that with each other. You can take notes on the outline if you've printed it off. Uh, if you have any questions uh, coming from the sermon, I suspect there might be this week, uh, please feel free to send them to Neil or myself uh, using the comments box down the bottom of this web page. Well, a few years ago, I watched a zombie movie. It's not a genre of movie uh, that I'm overly enthusiastic about or keen on, uh, but it did have Brad Pitt in it. Uh, World War Z. Uh, it was actually a very good movie. Uh, it was thoughtful and provocative, even more so now that we're living in a viral pandemic kind of world. Brad Pitt plays an investigator with the United Nations, or he used to work for the United Nations, who's called in to investigate a, a virus that is zombifying the whole world. Uh, his job is to work out where it's come from, uh, how it's moving, how it can be stopped. Now, in one sense, the carriers of the virus are obvious. It's all those flesh-eating monsters out there, and if they bite you within 12 seconds, you're one of them. But the investigation is a little more subtle than that. Uh, in essence, it's focused on working out how this virus spreads. What has caused it? I suspect that a lot of people looked at the spread of Christianity in the first century in the same kind of way. How's this thing spreading? How is it having such an impact? What can be done about it? We observed last week that the central theme of the gospel, which is spreading the virus, if you like, if you want to continue the analogy, is your king is able. Or put another way, Jesus is Lord. That message has changed people, like the people in Colossae who are now called Christians, to whom Paul and Timothy are writing. That lordship has moved them from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. They now have peace with God. But how is it spreading? Well, the answer is very simple. If you look a little earlier in Colossians 1.23, Paul describes himself as a servant of this very message. Someone who serves it by proclaiming it to the known world. It's spreading through carriers called servants of the gospel. Paul's one of them. But when you look at Paul, especially in his current predicament, 
And we kind of scratch our heads. After all, he's in jail. He's been reduced to writing letters to people he's never met. He looks a failure. How can the gospel of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that magnificent good news that your king is able, that we looked at last week, how can it spread through men who look like such failures? Well, today we're going to look at what a servant of the gospel looks like, why they were, why they are so confoundingly successful. Let me pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for your word that Paul penned this letter with Timothy from jail in Rome and that it's been preserved so that we in Narrabri can read it in 2020. Father, as we look at this sketch of a servant of the gospel, help us to remember that we're servants of the very same good news. Please transform our lives. Please transform our town through the spread of this good news. Please transform this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me give you a brief synopsis of where we've come from so far, just in case uh, a lot of the information has slipped out, if you're like me. Uh, Paul and Timothy have been visited by Epaphras. Uh, he's a local from the town of Colossae. He's come to them in Rome where Paul is in jail. He's come with a report about the local church in Colossae. It's around 60 or 61 AD. Uh, Paphras had met Paul, and more importantly Jesus, through Paul in Ephesus and had taken this message about Jesus, this person, back to his hometown of Colossae, situated in a valley in modern day Turkey. In Colossae, Epaphras had proclaimed the news about Jesus, this good news. And as he did so, people heard the truth. They were transformed. Epaphras continued to teach him, chapter 1, verse 8. As a community of God's people, they're traveling well. Just look at Paul's thanksgiving for them in chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. But Paul continues to pray for them, doesn't he? Remember that second prayer? That they know God, that they know his will, that they know his purpose, so that they continue with who they started with, Jesus. That prayer there in chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. Uh, in essence, these men and women have changed their postcode. Jesus has transferred them from the domain of darkness into his very own kingdom. And that change of postcode, that transfer, has transformed them. Paul and Timothy remind them that this Jesus, who is their Lord, put simply, he's their boss, is all that they need. They now live in his kingdom. They've changed postcodes. They're citizens of a new area in life. And Jesus is able to do everything for them that they need. Jesus can transfer and transform them because of who he is. Remember that magnificent passage last week. Your king is able. There's no need to go anywhere else. Now Paul has finished his discussion of this lordship of Jesus, his ability to do all these things. And as he's finished it, he's talked about how God has applied it to his life, he's become a servant of this gospel, this good news. Chapter 1, verse 23, I'm at point 2 on the outline. We've received no pictures of Paul. We don't have descriptions of his physical appearance except from the early church and some very obscure references. But we do have a description of him, perhaps the most important description of him as someone who serves the gospel the good news that Jesus is Lord. Listen to his description of himself in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I'm completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Paul describes himself as rejoicing in my sufferings for you. I want us to catch the meaning of what he's saying here. He's not being particularly British with a stiff upper lip. He's not saying that he bears up under stress. He's not saying that he's a grin and bear it kind of guy. He's not saying that he's stoic and keeps his mouth shut when the times are tough. Remember, Paul's in jail. Paul's a man who has 
suffered beatings and shipwrecks, who's been marooned, been under attack from both enemies and friends and poisonous snakes. In all this suffering, he's joyful. It's a mindset that's otherworldly, isn't it? In the sense that Paul rejoices in his sufferings. Think about the state of our world today and how absent the headlines in the media are about rejoicing. As we'll soon see, and as Jesus himself makes clear, remember from Matthew as he sends out the apostles, suffering is the plan of God for his people because they have Jesus as their Lord. Paul knows this and rejoices that God would give him this in such a way. How do you understand that? How do you comprehend that? As we dig a little bit deeper into this verse and what follows, we've got to understand what Paul is saying clearly here. He is suffering because he is under the lordship of Jesus, for being under the lordship of Jesus. It's not suffering because he's a human being in a broken world. Paul knows that his sufferings are one and the same with the rejection that his boss had, that Jesus had. I suspect that's driving what is going on here in this very hard to understand verse. Let me be very clear. As Neil made clear last week, as Paul and Timothy made clear in verses 15 to 20, there is nothing lacking in the sufficiency of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. That is sufficient completely to deal with God's judgment upon us as human beings. So Paul is not saying that. But to live with Jesus as Lord, to follow him, is to suffer like him. There's still suffering to undergo joyfully until the day that Paul and Timothy see Jesus return. We know that that's the lot of God's people. Remember again as Jesus sent out the apostles in Matthew as sheep amongst wolves. We know that God himself knows this, that he set an end point to the suffering. Mark chapter 13, verse 20, Romans 5, 1 to 5. What is lacking is we, we haven't yet experienced it all. Paul and Timothy haven't yet experienced it all. And so they fill up now as they experience the suffering that comes with following in the Lord who died for us. In that sense, Paul rejoices, gives thanks, welcomes it, understands it, prays through it. But it's not for his benefit. It's for the benefit of a community he's part of. Look there again in verse 24. For his body, that is the church. Paul's service to the gospel is his service to the Lord at the heart of the gospel, and it's for his body. Just as Paul persecuted the body of Christ by killing Christians and so persecuted Jesus, so now he serves Jesus by serving the very same body. Uh, It's not just something that's airy-fairy, intangible or spiritual. It's connected with a group of people, real people, people like you and me. People who lived in a regional town. People who shared the same Lord, Jesus. It's amazing that Paul would suffer for them even though he's never met them. In fact, Paul's language here is quite universal. I'm not just talking about the local church. It's one of those few times where when Paul talks about God's people, he's talking about Christians everywhere. People like you and me in Narrabri, just like people in the town of Colossae in that valley in Turkey. Paul didn't choose this job. Look there in verse 25. I have become its minister according to God's administration that was given to me for you to make God's message fully known. The language here is a language of God's administration, his supervision, his intervention, his overseeing, planning and supervision of all things all things that have ever taken place. Paul's been given a job. He's been made to do this under the full planning of God. 
It comes by God's intervention, by God's intention. It comes by God's purpose and wise planning. Remember that reading from Acts chapter 9? The change in Paul's direction in the very essence of his being on that road to Damascus where he moved from being a persecutor of Christians to a proclaimer of Christ. Remember what God said that he had in store for Paul, that he would be the messenger, the eyewitness to the Gentiles and God would teach him what it means to suffer in that. In that sense, the job that Paul has been given serves God's wider purposes. It's not for his gratification, Paul's gratification, though that will come. It's not for his reputation, though the way in which he does this job will forge his reputation. It's not for building up Paul's little kingdom, his little passionate ministry. No, it's for God's plans, the kingdom of God's son. Everything that Paul experiences as a servant of the gospel is under the plan of God. Nothing here is accidental. So what does the job involve? Well, look again at verse 25 and then into 26. I have become its minister according to God's administration that was given to me for you to make God's message fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Paul has the job of making God's message fully known. He has a speaking job, a job that involves proclamation. There's a message from the human side, which is a mystery. Now, it's not something that we need to go to a detective for or Sherlock Holmes or anything written by P.D. James. The mystery here is a description of what God has always intended and always planned but gradually revealed. The idea that God has made a commitment to roll back through Abraham's family the curse of sin in the world. God has gradually revealed that and made it known and people like Paul are proclaiming the fullness of it. The gospel is another name for the mystery. The good news that God has done exactly as he promised. Now if it's a mystery that's being made known, what is it? What's this fullness that is being made known? Well, it's there in verse 27. God wanted to make known to those among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is very simple. It's a person. It's his life, death, and resurrection. It's Jesus and the fact that he's the Lord of the universe. The mystery is that through the lordship of this man, Jesus, people like the Colossians, people like us, Gentiles, any human being, can actually be at peace with God, even though by nature we're rebels. It's not a distant or abstract idea. Did you notice there that it is actually in you, Christ in you, his lordship over you, your very life, you Christians in Colossae, you Christians in Narrabri? It's deeply personal. It's a virus, if you like, that is in you, that has taken hold of you, that now rules you, and it's God's desire his want to have this mystery made known to all creation. Well, how's it going to be made known? We're working our way gradually through what it looks like to be a servant, how this mystery is spreading, this news of Jesus. Well, how is it going to be made known? Well, look there in verse 28. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul's favoured method of delivery, God's planned method of delivery, is verbal proclamation. It's the announcement of the news that Jesus is Lord. It's like being a town crier going into the public square and saying, Hear ye, hear ye, there is a truth that changes reality. Pay attention. That's how the message is to be taken out. On the one hand, it's a warning. 
as we present Jesus, as Paul presents Jesus, as Timothy presents Jesus, as the servants of the gospel present this man Jesus, there is a warning that we humans are rebels by nature, sinners opposed to God in the domain of darkness, in desperate need that we do not even perceive ourselves. There's a warning there. On the other hand, there's a teaching of bringing to a full understanding that Jesus is able to take us out of darkness, to bring us into God's kingdom, to restore us to true humanity. Uh, In essence, the message is very simple. The proclamation is very simple. It is Jesus is able. Jesus is Lord. But it's also important to notice how Paul expands his language here. Did you notice that he moves from I language to we language, from singular to plural. You see, there's more than one carrier of this mystery, more than one servant of the gospel. Epaphras is one. His co-author Timothy is one. Others are servants of the gospel. The location changes, the culture might change, the geography might change, but the message is still wonderfully the same and simple. Jesus is able. Jesus is Lord. So what's the long-term outcome of this spread? The plan, if you like, the end goal. Well, it's there in verse 28. So that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Perfect, if you like. As they should be, as God designed them to be in Jesus. Paul suffers joyfully for the church at God's intervention and planning for the proclamation of Jesus who is Lord of all things with the aim that his set plan is that God's mob mature, that the body of Jesus grows up. But we also need to notice two things about this. It's not a new idea, firstly, is it? Remember that prayer from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12? And notice, secondly, that the maturity is in Christ. At the heart of this maturity is also the essence of the starting point. Jesus is enough. He's Lord enough for them to be moved from the domain of darkness into his own kingdom. He's Lord enough for them to grow in their membership of that kingdom, what it means to be truly human. Well, how will this take place? It's an immense job, isn't it, when you put it like that? How will this take place? How is it possible for anyone, any human being, to bear such a burden and load? Look at verse 29. I labour for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. God's intervention gave Paul the job. God's planning circumscribes the job. God's energy drives the job. In many ways, that is intangible. It's often only in hindsight as people look back that they understand how God has worked in them. Paul's like that a number of times as he recounts what he's gone through in his own life. But it also returns us to the question we had at the beginning because we start to boil it down here. How does this news that Jesus is enough, is able, is Lord, how does that travel? It travels by the servants of the gospel who largely are, 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 are an unimpressive bunch. On any worldly standard, Paul's a failure. He's turned his back on a brilliant career. He's taken on a life of immense hardship and persecution. He's been locked up in jail with a death sentence over his head. He's reduced to writing letters to people he's never met. And yet through letters like this, this man continues to be a super spreader. Jesus is Lord. The only explanation could be that God is doing it through these people. The impressive thing here is not Paul. It's the God who uses Paul. In fact, strip back, that's the answer to how does this spread? It spreads as God uses these servants. In that sense, these frail tools, these imprisoned men and women, well, they actually 
are so frail that they direct our attention to God, the one who administers and drives and intervenes and plans and supervises and reveals his mystery, his work, his son, his kingdom. And in the end, it's not as abstract as it might sound. I mean, Paul started big here, hasn't he, talking about the global perspective and God's great plans. But when you drive down to it, it's, it's actually for real people, even people he's not meant. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse one. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those in Laodicea, for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of a short understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Paul reiterates his job here, doesn't he? Summarises it, but brings it home a a lot more personally to help people have a deep and mature knowledge to understand that Jesus is enough, Jesus is Lord. That's his struggle and desire, even for strangers. But I think the key is verse 3. Let me just read it again. In him, that's Christ, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Put bluntly, Jesus as Lord is all you need for life. Jesus as Lord is all that God's people need for life in him. In Jesus, Jesus as Lord, are all the deposits, all the debts of wisdom and knowledge. They're kept in him. They're hidden in him. But this is the, this is the crucial thing out of this. They're being made known in him. That's the essence of what Paul is about here, Paul and Timothy. The essence of the sufficiency of Jesus. That Jesus is enough for life. Let me say that again. That Jesus as Lord is enough for all of life. And Paul works to make that clear for people he's not even met. Now I'll receive a lot of letters. And some of those letters are from people I've never met before. I received one the other day. It was a long handwritten letter that was hard to read. One of the things that made it really hard to read was that the person didn't make their intentions clear. Other letters are different. Uh, They're from people I've not met, but eventually the person makes their intentions clear. Paul's a clear writer. He makes his intentions clear. Look there in verse 4. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. For I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the strength of your faith in Christ. That this that Paul is referring to is as much to everything he said about himself as it is to what immediately proceeds. Uh, On the one hand, he's laid out his role as a servant of the gospel for a purpose. On the other hand, he's laid out the sufficiency of Jesus for the very same purpose. Please don't move from Jesus. Don't be deceived. Don't be persuaded that there's more to Jesus or less than Jesus. Jesus as Lord is enough. Here's the heart of Paul's concern as he sits in jail and writes to people that Epaphras has given him a report about. Paul's concern uh, in his prayers, in his proclamation, in his job, is that these fellow citizens in the kingdom of Jesus know that Jesus as Lord is enough. Don't, Don't be deceived. Now, they actually seem to be doing quite well. Remember we said that in in the first week in Colossians? Even not knowing them, being absent physically, Paul's heard of how well they are doing, but the danger lurks that they'll begin to think, that they'll be persuaded to think that Jesus as Lord is not enough for life. That life consists of more than knowing Jesus, that life consists in knowing less than Jesus. Paul doesn't want that to happen. Paul writes to them. In jail, he struggles for them. He contends for them. He fights for them. 
so that they will remain firmly of the understanding and life that Jesus as Lord is enough. No matter how fine sounding the alternatives are or look or feel or taste or sound, Jesus as Lord is enough. Well, that's how the spread of the gospel can be explained by servants of the gospel and God working through them. Men like Paul, Epaphras, Timothy, other people mentioned in the New Testament. They're empowered by God, given a job and a mission and a message from God to spread the truth that Jesus as Lord is enough. In many ways, we've got nothing in common with these men and women. They lived at a different time, in a very different culture, with completely different lives. They had a unique job in the history of the world, a job that we will never have as the first eyewitnesses and messages of this news called the gospel. So what do we do with it now then? I'm at point five on the outline. On one level, all that we can do, uh, that sounds a bit rough, doesn't it? But all that we can do is give thanks to God for people like these, these servants of the gospel. In some amazing way, we meet in our households in Narrabri because of the servants of the gospel in Colossae and in that valley where the Colossians lived. We're part of that church community, the body of Jesus that's not seen them or met them, yet Paul's rejoicing in suffering has led in some way to us meeting the same Lord Jesus. It's part of a global and timeless plan to bring people like us to a day like today where we can enjoy fellowship with God. Now, we should thank God for that. Perhaps we should also learn a little more about these men and women. Perhaps we should become familiar with our spiritual predecessors, the great servants of the gospel in the past, and the less great as well, the servants of the gospel who've made sure that the message of truth is proclaimed in all creation. Perhaps as a parent, you might like to grab books like this, 10 girls, 10 boys who live their lives as God's people, as servants of the gospel throughout the world. Read them with your sons and daughters. Learn from them yourselves. Perhaps as maybe someone a little older, you might want to grab the Swans Are Not Silent series written by John Piper as he outlines in Christian biography, men and women who were valiant servants of the gospel. In that way, not only will we get familiar with them, we might learn from them, give thanks for them from God. And on another level, let me ask, are we any different to uh, Paul and Epaphras and Timothy? Let me be blunt. We share the same Lord, which means we share the same servant brotherhood. Now, they are different to us. Don't hear me wrongly. Their job was unique at a very unique moment in time. But let me suggest to you that in looking at Paul and Timothy and the other servants of the gospel, we, we're given a glimpse, a sketch of our lives as servants of the very same Lord. Now, they're no better than us. That's the wonderful democracy of salvation in Jesus as Lord. The one Lord rules us all and we all serve him. So... Let me close by giving you some glimpses from this sketch of a servant of the gospel. Our servanthood will bring suffering. It's not a byproduct. It's not an accident. It's not an unfortunate thing that we must try to avoid. It's actually God's purposeful planning of the lives of his people. As they walk following their Lord, they will walk, walk worthy of that very same Lord. And as they experience that suffering, they will do so for the benefit of the people of God. Our suffering as servants should be met with joy. It's a privilege to have a father who helps us mature. It's a privilege and a blessing to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus who purchased us by his suffering. It's not a flippant joy, as we'll learn later on. It's not a head in the clouds kind of separation from reality. 
It's not a whinging or a blaming. It doesn't belittle or lessen the true effect of sin on us or the damage of suffering. But it does place the suffering for the Lord as a privilege rendered to those who are growing in maturity. Our servanthood is to be of the Lord. It's to be of the news that Jesus is enough for the benefit of the whole church. Let me encourage you to live your, lift your vision beyond Capita, beyond the Liverpool Plains, beyond the Narrabri Shire boundaries, beyond the Anglican Diocese of Armidale, beyond even Australia. Our perspective for our lives as servants of the gospel must encompass those we have not met yet. That's the sensational thing about our mission partners that we can serve them and the cultures they work in and the people of those cultures by praying for their work as co-servants of the gospel and supporting them financially. Our servanthood will be one of proclaiming this news to all of creation. The spread of the gospel doesn't happen through what we do. It happens through what we proclaim. The evidence of the transformation that our Lord has brought in us is seen in our practice and the practice goes with our proclamation. That right coordination of the two is part of what it means to walk worthy of the Lord and it's to go to all creation, all those who bear the image of God. Our servanthood is to be powered and planned by the very nature, desire and strength of God. We shouldn't miss sight of that truth. It's in that prayer in verses 9 to 14 of chapter 1. It will often be a truth evident in hindsight. It will often be a truth that we acknowledge in future days. But it is to be where our energy is sourced from where our servanthood has its engine. And our servanthood must not be deceived. And we're going to look at that next week. Let me pray. Our Father, we give you thanks that through the Lord Jesus, who he is and what he's done, as we heard last week, you are able to transfer us from the domain of darkness into his kingdom. Father, we pray that you'll enable this truth to transform us, to change us, to bring us to be people who walk as people of the Lord. Father, we give you thanks for those great servants of the gospel from the past. We give you thanks that we can walk with them because of them in the knowledge of our Lord through them. Father, we pray that you will help us to hold on to this truth that Jesus as Lord is enough. Father, we pray that you'll strengthen us not only to proclaim it but to practice it, to rejoice in the sufferings that you will bring because we are your people. And Father, we pray that you'll protect us from fine-sounding arguments that might lead us astray. In Jesus' name, amen.